Thank you, Emily. I'm glad that you bring up gene therapy because that's coming back with a vengeance. <laughs> yeah, um, when I left UPenn, we, uh, we did the last monkey study and then we had a hold on all gene therapy. And then two years ago, they approved the Luxterna, so it was a great uh, postdoc year spent at UPenn. So um, I'm going to talk, uh, I looked at Sophie's, uh, or <laughs> Sophie looked at my presentation and said, don't talk about this, don't talk about this, I'm doing it. And I looked at Inder, who also talked, so I'm going to just talk about the regulatory expectations in the line of uh, what Inder just said. So, but I do have some proof of concept slides, which, um, were more that what Merck wanted. So this is just to tell people that you're trying to convince your management to do more of these work streams, how to go about it, because we struggled at Amgen and now a little bit struggle at Merck, but they were much more open to doing these kind of approaches. So there is a whole strategy. Uh, Sophie has mentioned how to do it because you had a mishap with bocosimab, so you had a reasoning to do it. But people who have good molecules, they, they think they are um, untouchable. <laughs> I know whom I'm pointing to. <laughs> so um, this is something that um, was presented by the agency, um, Amy Rosenberg, as well as um, uh, uh, by uh, Joao, who, who loves to bring these slides with a lot of factors that can cause immunogenicity, so you don't even know where to start, but there is a way to deal with these factors. So, um, and I think Inder Paul just <laughs> went through this too, but what I would like to say is that for us, um, if you want to start, start very early, and that means you have to look at your molecules right after humanization when the target has been validated and ask the question, is the intrinsic immunogenicity, uh, what is the potential of that intrinsic immunogenicity due to sequence or structure or uh, where it's coming from in terms of species, and is there a way to address it? So that's where we start, and uh, there is a flow chart later on which shows in developability there, there are several places where if you start early, you have a window of time to implement these tools and still be able to help optimize the sequence or, de or re-engineer it or at least candidate rank it. And those are important components because you are at least reducing the probability of immunogenicity up front. And then, of course, you'll deal with the other factors which are uh, on the right side, but they are very specific to the clinical trials, patients, and how you formulate and what route you go with. <clears throat> so uh, again, this, uh, this slide was shown just now, and so not to talk about it too much, but uh, it does say molecular structure is important, so look at sequence, uh, look at the product production system, uh, the formulation, uh, where we are spending a lot of time right now just because our dose, um, dosing regimens are changing. We are trying to do combination dosing, which means that you might have one formulation with two proteins inside it, or you're doing two formulations separately, but you're co-injecting it. So there are all these permutation combinations which changes the way a body will look at these proteins now just because you might have two proteins that are cross-presented and the risk might change. So um, definitely formulation and drug product handling is a big um, a concern as well as a huge working group within AAPS currently which has uh, new answers of immunogenicity risk. Um, then, the com then comes the product mechanism of action where we have had uh, experiences, Joachim can speak to it too, but it's more about um, t target engagement of our immune modulatory target. And you can start with a very clean sequence, but if you modulate the T-cell responses to the extent that it's an autoimmune condition, you can suddenly lose tolerance of a very clean drug product, and you might make antibodies even to uh, sequences which were not supposed to be um, immunogenic. So again, how, uh, how do you deal with an immunogenicity there, and is that even a relevant immunogenicity? So maybe more work is needed in the, uh, at the time of looking at the relevance by impact on exposure, safety, efficacy, rather than worrying about that number, which is an ADA incidence of 50% or 60%, because it might be just an immune response but not doing much. And finally, we have uh, worked a lot on the variants, uh, aggregated 
aggregation, clipped forms, oxidation, deamidation. With antibodies, we have done stress studies with those and shown that maybe aggregation is not that big of a concern unless uh, you're really, um, make, uh, are, it's only a red flag for some molecules where there's an endogenous component. So all of those have to be looked in uh, the perspective of where it's going, how much aggregation, and uh, is it really changing the uh, target to a certain extent. So uh, just to summarize the way we look at in silico or the risk assessment tools, uh, we look at it in a systematic way in the way the protein would be taken up, uh, presented and processed, and then drive a T cell response. So based on that, there are different kinds of algorithms that can be applied. And uh, so we went through most of them today. And um, I'll just say that we look at first the antigen uptake through an antigen-presenting cell. Those cell types could be PBMCs, DCT cells, or sorry, DCs, or even cell lines, which are monocyte-derived. <clears throat> we have our own internally uh, mined uh, data mined from mass spec data as well as uh, some of the database which is out there, a library which we called as Apple. I think Jad might have talked about it last year. Uh, but what we want to do is look at what are the likelihood of sequences that get presented and then uh, just look at this library instead of running a mass spec uh, maps assay every time, at least for antibodies because there's a lot of information now available. And then comes the next part, which is more about the binding of that peptide to the, uh, at, in the context of MHC. And again, these were discussed today, so we use four or five of these just to be able to do an orthogonal validation as well as confirming whatever components are missing of, from one algorithm with the other. And then lastly, we have uh, something where we look at the T cell repertoire and its ability to bind to that pocket, but now we are using homology, a lot of homology with known databases. Uh, there is a Janus matrix, which in a way complements it, but uh, we don't rely on one thing. We try to confirm it with a couple different uh, algorithms. Uh, so again, this was um, more uh, talked about earlier on, and um, <coughs> so within Merck, there was some effort that was done uh, within Epivax. They have done it for a while now, but what we try to do is we want to gain that alignment across and look at processing, cross-reactivity, and sequence homology to come with the final uh, decision for our discovery teams. So this is a very good example of conservative algorithm-based outputs, and I'm actually using uh, Keytruda here. And so if we had, if we had gone with Keytruda without, um, like, with just one algorithm, we, would have, we, we do find that there are th uh, two um, epitopes in the heavy chain and one in the light chain. And going by the ranking, they all look in the red zone, which means they were going to bind MHC class two alleles. A lot of those MHC alleles were going to be bound, so it was a promiscuous epitope. So uh, it would have been a, a Kitruda would have been a immunogenic sequence based on this first analysis. But when we applied the antigen processing tool to it, we found that two of these were not necessarily being processed and presented. So uh, by looking at just the binding of that uh, cluster to the, uh, to the class two MHCs, yes, they could bind. But were they, if the protein was given to a cell, would they process it? Maybe not. So we got rid of two of these um, and um, made it much more um, less false positives, I guess. And then Finally, we also looked for the cross-reactivity, and suddenly the last cluster also went away. So, so this is the way an algorithm could become potentially false positive to nothing. And <coughs> so it just gives you that uh, message that, uh, yes, algorithms are very efficient. They are high throughput. They can do all of that. But we still need to somehow uh, confirm it with other orthogonal methods, which we tried to do just with algorithms, but by the way, we also did in vitro assays to confirm what we saw. So um, there are two ways we use these. We use it at the epitope level where we are looking at the actual clusters within the protein, and then we are also looking at clusters within the proteins that have been immunogenic uh, by, by in vitro assays or in clinic, and we are comparing clusters versus the aggregate scale, which looks at the whole protein and its ability to get processed 
uh, by antigen presenting cell and then what is the likelihood of that one cluster to become immunogenic. Um, so if you notice that some of these proteins, if, even if they're coming up in the red zone here in the aggregate scale, they do come down, and that's just more about the probability that there's competition and you're not going to always express that one cluster. It will be always in the context of other sequences. So this is the methodology. It seems a lot, but it's just as much more uh, in detail, granular detail for our discovery engineers so they are making the right decisions. We talk about uh, taking the protein sequences through our algorithms and we predict epitope, whether it's self or non-self. So if it is self, then we call it out as a low risk and um, we don't try to do much with it. But if it is non-self, then we do put it through the mass spec algorithm. We also uh, put it through looking at the homology and at that point we ask, is it greater than 80% homologous or less than 80%? And if it is, um, greater than 80%, then we say, okay, maybe it's not a risk because it's something we have seen before and we don't expect to uh, mount a response. But if it is less than, then we say, okay, let's uh, look at uh, the, uh, uh, try to do an in vitro assay and what are we going to see with the positive and negative in vitro assay and which peptides are coming up much more. So that's where we go into further characterization, whether it's for the DCT cell or a PBMC assay. And then at the end, we provide that feedback back to the team saying that these are the clusters we feel would benefit from deimmunization. So uh, the, here are some examples. So this is an example of a nanobody. So this is, uh, it was considered a novel modality for us and we didn't know how to proceed. There were lots of nanobodies that were humanized from LAMA uh, framework into human. So when we looked at just the framework itself without even looking at the actual target domains where it was going to bind, uh, the, um, Ab Links, who was our partner, uh, had done a good job with uh, humanizing it. So we did not find LAMA regions <laughs> coming up as immunogenic. But the real problem started when we started putting our own domains in it, which were uh, going to bind to these immunomodulatory uh, uh, targets. And there, that's where we did uh, rank ordering and decided to go with the most, the least um, risky sequence. And uh, the place where we did this was um, the, the leads were already identified uh, and their stability had been done. And at the first round, the framework, frameworks were being optimized and the mutations were being made. So we did uh, contribute to that analysis with the algorithm. And in the round two, where the actual like, um, domains that were going to be our drug product targets, that's where we had much more um, input into the nanobodies. So the first three nanobodies, no one did much and we already started observing that they had a high risk, but the last two nanobodies before Sanofi got ablinks um, is, um, is where we had contribution in their engineering. And interestingly, they were already doing the in vitro assays with, uh, I believe, um, I don't know if Proimmune did it or uh, we saw the in vitro data, so we saw that some of their nanobodies were much more uh, immunogenic than the others, so it uh, correlated with this rank ordering here. So we got uh, a completely different validation of whatever we had predicted with what they had already done with in vitro assays. So this is another example. I did block, block out the actual sequence just because of proprietary reasons, but what we found here was, uh, this was our approach for deimmunization. It was a protein FC conjugate, and um, uh, or actually it was an antibody to a, an enzyme, sorry. And we found that there were two clusters, and um, or one cluster in the heavy chain, and that was immunogenic. And we asked our protein engineer to give us iterations of that with the different mutations. And these were just uh, changing amino acid at a time uh, within these HLA DR alleles uh, that we were finding to be promiscuous. And then uh, she told us the one which was the best, which would not cause any problems with stability was this specific mutant. So when we put that in the algorithm, it came down. And then we followed that with doing an in vitro assay to show that we lost the reactivity in T cells. So um, I want to stop the tools and all of that here and go to the regulatory expectations. So this slide was uh, shared by uh, Joao, I think, last year or this year. But what, the, what they are saying is that 
the risk assessment and uh, is a continuous process and it can't stop after looking at the intrinsic sequence because there will be changes as in the pal said during the process and you will see new kind of entities come up and how they change the final integrity of your molecule no one knows because you have to test for it so there are some things that have improved uh, which and also we have gained some confidence on antibody processes through um, uh, the clinical experience. So there are many things now you can argue that these are not important. Um, host cell proteins and aggregates are two of those because you have seen them being asked as questions, but now the, those questioning has reduced because uh, through the experience, through long-term trials, through the experience of different sponsors where um, host cell proteins have changed across the process and no adverse events have been reported, you can go back and argue that maybe it's not that big of a deal in the context of the whole protein. But, but even then, they would ask you to monitor for these changes and tell them how much of this has changed from a phase one to phase two to phase three. So that... Uh, whether we have to do these assays to prove it, maybe not, but we still need to be prepared to look for these changes and uh, be prepared to discuss it in our package, the IND package or even the integrated summary of immunogenicity. So uh, the recommendation is to do a risk assessment and summarize it. And um, also the recommendation is that start a integrated summary of immunogenicity document very early on during IND and keep it as a live document where you keep on plugging in the experience from each stage uh, so that when the time comes for BLA, you already have a very good picture of what that risks look like and you have clinical experience to add to it saying that yes, we identified the change in the attribute but it did not mean that we suddenly saw an incidence increase of immunogenicity or impact on exposure or even a sudden change in adverse events. So um, definitely doing that in a systematic way will, will be, uh, we will do a better job analyzing it at the end and you're also not placing your biostatistical uh, counterparts under stress that uh, you want to make all these tables and you want to run those analysis, you're doing it as you go. So they're also conditioned to do it with you rather than having a bunch of data in phase three and you say go and look for um, narratives or terms, et cetera, for safety. So um, some of the stages for risk assessment that have been proposed um, at the time of prior to IND. So we do all write INDs and now there is a, in the new guidance there, under documentation subsection, they say during the IND provide a summary of whatever risks have, you have identified. So the only risks we know at that time is the intrinsic sequence risk or we know about the target, which is a risk because if you are going to engage T cells or dendritic cells, those are going to enhance the immune response. So those can indirectly also enhance the immunogenicity. So that is a risk and talking about it upfront rather than hiding it is in fact a good, good thing. And, um, and finally, if you are noticing something weird with the stability, so for nanobody, for example, the one which I showed, we were already noticing 30% of the nanobody deamidating even sitting around. So um, what does that mean in terms of risk? We don't know. It's a nanobody, uh, not much has been done in terms of clinical experience. But uh, with antibodies, we did know that deamidation might not be a big deal. Herceptin is 40% deamidated after in commercial formulation and it's been given to people and we don't see much um, that adverse event or immunogenicity at least from that perspective. Whether it's lost efficacy, we don't know, but at least we don't see safety issues. So we could always argue that, but we could not argue for a nanobody, the same um, argument could not, uh, would not have passed. So for, for that reason, we did do some work with our deamidated nanobody just to be able to have that information handy if we need to use it at some point. So then uh, the next time we, we would like to uh, do this risk assessment would be during uh, the end of uh, phase two trials, by which time you have generated enough data, you have enough uh, clinical experience, you, you also know the impact on PKPD, and it's to, the, to the, uh, your advantage if you're not seeing much immunogenicity or even safety concerns, 
Um, but it's also, even if you see immunogenicity, phase two might be a better time to look for it rather than phase one, which is single dose and short term, and you might not see what you need to see. So uh, we have seen examples of where people have been premature and talked about phase one uh, experience and say, oh, it looks great, and we are doing great. And, <laughs> and six months later, you, you have to go back and say, okay, maybe not, because uh, you did six cycles of your drug, and uh, it's a lot of immunogenicity. PK is gone, and especially with immune modulation, it just comes with a big bang, and everything is gone. So, uh, so I think it's important to just delay your summary of immunogenicity or experience, and even looking at the uh, the safety data for six months past to get a better experience of what multiple dose does. And so this will continue on till the BLA submission, and at that time you will have phase three data, pivotal study data. So uh, at all stages, you're also changing the process material, so that knowledge can also go in this risk assessment. And finally, uh, with the BLA, you have this integrated summary of immunogenicity with uh, proposed sections where you can place all of these. So, um, and this is exactly what they are saying. They are saying that analysis of program and product risk factors should include the product CMC factors, the patient. So that was the other thing. In the clinical trials, you will have indications that change over a period of time. Especially in oncology, you're going to see multiple INDs go to the agency with different cancers. And so every time the IND is written, you can use the experience from the previous IND, but sometimes the, on, the indication is going to be very specific, so you have to talk about the risk in those. Um, and then finally, the trial design factors. Um, we are now talking about the formulation because we are going to do some new uh, trial designs where we are doing the combination dosing, which was different from the monotherapies that were done before, or even when the drug products were administered in two <laughs> different injections rather than one formulation. So will that change the safety risk? So you have to talk about that in your risk assessment. So. Uh, I'll not go into the CMC because it was discussed. Um, so I think the challenge uh, currently in the FDA reviewers' minds is that during the IND, there was no section as such which would talk about immunogenicity risk assessment. So the, the minimal thing we would write is that this is our uh, immunogenicity bioanalytical strategy, which was also very vague. We would say, yes, we will look for antibodies, uh, we don't talk about which assay format would be used. It was just like an antibody assay would be developed to support phase one studies. And uh, that was just the immunogenicity that was part of that. And maybe there was some clinical trial related uh, information that you will run it for a month or three months and it would be sub-Q dosing or IV dosing arms, but nothing about uh, what the risk of that program is. So th their suggestion is that in the CTD module in the 5.3, uh, start building a risk assessment section and maybe put a part of it also in your IND with whatever knowledge you have of the, uh, of the molecule's intrinsic risk or developability risk and just summarize it. Uh, so from, from our perspective for the last year and a half, we have done six to seven different INDs and all of them have had this section which has been provided, and we have also appended to that the entire in silico report as an appendix uh, or an attachment, and any in vitro <laughs> data we have generated has also gone with that. And we have summarized the outcome of that in the main, um, this section of the IND. Um, so the additional um, information, so the, the way we approach it is that we start with the risk assessment and we say, okay, this molecule does not appear to be a high risk, so we are not going to, our um, bioanalytical strategy will follow this approach. So we do not try to do neutralizing antibody assays or a lot of epitope or domain characterizations or titers. We just say we are going to run an, a simple anti-drug antibody assay, which is screening format, and we're going to collect the PK, and hopefully if there is a PD, then great, because you can then connect all that information and say, did you see an impact on PK or PD? And all that knowledge can help you decide how impactful that immunogenicity was. In cases, we have also written that we're not going to do immunogenicity assessments for low-risk molecules where we do not see an impact on PK. So we are going to collect and hold the samples in the trial 
and wait till the end of the phase one, understand the PKNPD and decide if we want to run it. So that has gone in the IND as a specific proposal with uh, acceptance from agency where we have said the risk was low. So, so again, it's a, it's a paradigm change, but unless we do it, we don't know. And the worst case scenario is they'll say we do not agree, do everything which we were anyway planning to do. So it's, not, it, it's a matter of do you want to delay your phase three readiness assays or do you want to do them up front? And in case of nanobody, for example, with two immunomodulatory domains, we did call it out as a low risk and uncertain because we didn't know, have experience with nanobodies, and that's where we said we'll put in our <laughs> efforts and develop all the assays. So again, this is more of FDA's um, guidance on the risk-based approach on what is your rationale for the st strategy at the IND stage for phase one, and which, which assays do you think you will develop later on. And it has a cost advantage just from a sponsor's perspective, even though you can't use that argument with the agency, but in the sense that there are trials that never go beyond phase one sometimes, if there are no efficacy, if the, you don't see efficacy for other reasons, or then you have developed all these extensive neutralizing assays which might not even be used. So, so there is a value in presenting this and proposing this up front rather than developing everything and then not using it. So, so for other risk level products, um, the agency says yes, you can store samples. Um, you can do the fit for purpose assays. You can wait till you uh, have all the data for phase two and then if needed, you can do phase one. And anyway, in, in my experience, when we write the integrated summary of immunogenicity, phase one data is always kept separate from uh, pivotal studies just because they don't have long-term exposure. So it does not give you a very good measure of immunogenicity anyway. So we always say, okay, we did phase one, and sometimes you see immunogenicity, sometimes you don't. So it does not have that uh, follow through to what we are going to see for the true long-term studies. So this is um, our recommend, uh, proposal that during the IND, or the document that would be used to support IND, this is the component of a risk-based <laughs> clinical immunogenicity strategy. And it will start with a very brief background of whatever drug we are talking about, its target, which general indication in terms of disease it's going to be targeted to. Then we go systematically through all the risks we have already looked at. And may, you might not have all of them, maybe one, but whatever it is, you just provide that there. Um, for INDs that have already been submitted for other indications, if you have results, then summarize those, and then you go into your clinical strategy with uh, whatever monitorings uh, you want to perform. We did add in this uh, HLA typing, so a lot of our new protocols is including HLA genotyping of all the subjects that are being dosed with drug product, and we've done that more with the high-risk molecules because we want to also say that uh, for people whom we think are predisposed, we're going to monitor them for safety events much more. So um, I, I'd like to say that we are doing this much more at a uh, industry level, and uh, Joachim and I have been involved with APS industry forums um, quite a bit, and now he's going to lead this, uh, the, our existing forum going this year and um, it's called the Risk Assessment and Mitigation Working Room. I would like everyone in this room to join that. I think several people have been members for a while, and um, we are also writing a survey paper on all these tools so we can all harmonize, um, which is what um, Sophie had mentioned, that we need harmonization on our readouts and what we interpret out of these tools. So that survey will be uh, published as a paper soon. Um, and again, um, we have a T-cell white paper effort also going on where we are going to also talk about the best use of the T-cell-based assays. So this is the second version of the paper which was written in 2013. And on the left side is Abbey Risk that Sophie covered, uh, which is more of the European effort that was done which has helped us to t take our assays to the next level. So. So I will acknowledge my Merck team here, the Jad, uh, Carly uh, are both the wet lab, uh, they do all the algorithm and the wet lab work, 
hopefully you can hear from Carly next year because she has developed very interesting <coughs> cell line. These are monoallelic uh, antigen presenting cell line, al almost like artificial antigen presenting cells, and they can interact with different soluble T cell receptors. And we hope that it could be a answer to our not doing the cumbersome maps all the time. So it's an alternate to maps. So definitely next year she will be able to share that. So um, and then. Um, Diana is the one who writes all the IND documents for us, uh, just takes all this risk assessment data and puts it together for the filings. Michael is working on the innate response, the impurity work, and we did some work with uh, biocatalysis, with deamidation, so he's using more of those cell lines. And Josiah is the one who models all the data for immunogenicity for looking at impact on PKPD. And we have two protein engineers, Veronica and Laurence, in our discovery group who are the who are very excellent at optimization sequences and doing the developability. Thank you. Join our survey. <laughs> <laughs> so so you so you should change you guys definitely um, in the integrated immunogenicity uh, risk assessment, you have a, you put your all in silico report and, and any in vitro work you put in there. Whereas yes. that that is not specifically asked for in the, um, but, it, but I do think, you know, obviously, I, I think we're all in favor of, of submitting that, but I think just more, more of that data that goes to the agency, the more familiar they become with it. So I think it's, it's going to reviewers who have already talked about it. So when you talk to people like Joao or Amy Rosenberg or Daniela, these are the people who are reviewers or these are the consultants for the, uh, the Clint Farm reviewers who would look at the immunogenicity. So I think we are targeting to people who know how to interpret this. And I know that some of these tools, agency is using, like Zubin Sana is using these tools. He has published with Novo Nordis. So I don't think there is any sensitivity, at least from Merck's perspective, when we provided that feedback that we would like to support this by adding the granularity. It was fine because uh, we made the case that this is not something um, sensitive in a way it's showing due diligence and it's also showing that we know where to look for problems so so we have it's not backfired in any ways you know the in vitro assays we have heard question uh, a lot of concern they say what if we put it in especially the you have a T general effect and it's like cytokine storm how do you explain it so maybe not do those assays but again we have been able to justify that we are teasing out the um, target mediated engagement from sequence, and so we still know how to interpret that or manage that data or results. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Viva. Uh, quick question, going back to what Andrea was, say, was saying about uh, immunodominance. You know, mentioned at the very uh, in, in your introduction when we use uh, two biologics, we inject two biologics. Do you, you did some work around that, right? To, to try and assess when you have a combination of uh, yeah. uh, biologics I, yeah. and what, what does it do in our assays? Do you find differences when you have the two, say, in, in your MAPS assay? Do you, have, do you see differences in uh, the peptides that are presented when you, have the, when you test them separately? So the, what we have done is in the combination studies, and uh, I, I want Jack to present that, but we took people who had been dosed with the combination therapies, and we asked the question that are we enhancing the immunogenicity of something which was not immunogenic when it was given as a monotherapy? And it's very, very interesting. You do find that the, the molecules, uh, the sequence which was not coming up in a monotherapy in the mass spec is showing up in the combination. So, so it is say, telling us that there is a the hypothesis might be right, and it does not have to. So, it was a not a immunogenic epitope. It was, it had some ability to bind to the MHC, <coughs> but we were not calling it out as a 
highly like a red zone. So it tells you that you may be a breaking tolerance or your T cells now have a small, uh, less threshold to get activated by seeing a sequence, but it's very interesting. And you see that in the clinical incidence of immunogenicity, like antibody rates are high. So that's what we are trying to prove in these subjects, like are you seeing more sequences from that drug product being presented? And it seems like yes, in the combination. Is that when you look at the H sub A percent of peptide combinations, or is, uh, can you do that in vitro? No, no, so we took patients and we did the recall response because these are people <laughs> who have been dosed with both the products. And they have known uh, incidents of ADA, so we had all that information. Yeah. We're just testing, te checking what are they presenting. So do you think you can, do you do a combination mass assay? The, I, I just thought of that when she brought that question yeah. because I thought she's asking combination maps and that would be interesting to do, but yeah. we haven't done that. But maybe we can use Carly's assay to do it. It will be easier because you can use two peptides to compete on that same. So yeah. it will be a much faster and easier readout. So maybe next year we'll have that. Okay. <laughs>